Welcome. This is the Lifetime Cash Flow through Real Estate Investing Podcast. This is where you'll learn strategies to help you achieve lifetime financial freedom through real estate investment. Your host, Rod Cleef, has owned over 2,000 homes and apartments, and he brings experts in all aspects of real estate investment and management onto the show. Now, here's your host, Rod Cleef. Welcome to another edition of How to Build Lifetime Cash Flow Through Real Estate Investing. I'm Rod Cleef, and I'm thrilled you're here. And I'm really delighted to interview the guy I'm interviewing today, basically because he's cool and he's generous and he's just an overall nice guy and I'm excited to get into his history, his book, and how he can add value to you guys because he absolutely can add value to you. His name is Tim Shiner. He's author of a book called The 50 Things They Didn't Teach You in School, which is like makes my hair stand on end because it's something that I, I'm very passionate about, how little you actually learn in school, uh, the important things, the life things, the financial things, the entrepreneurship, you know, all these things that they don't teach in school. So this book really resonated with me and just excited to have you on the show, brother. <laughs> Rod, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. It's funny, you and I were talking off mic a little bit. I'm kind of going to be the guest that tells you what not to do, you know, like, uh, like when they bring the prisoner to school to try to scare him straight. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, I love it. Yeah. So, so yeah, I was trying to ask, I was asking Tim about his multifamily experience and his experience to date has not been a positive one. And I said, you know what? Let's share it anyway, because there's some fantastic lessons in it. Now, now let's talk about your portfolio when you bought it, what you did with it, and, uh, and let's, let's go ahead and dig in right there then. Sure. So I had, I had 153 doors. Most of those doors were multifamily. Mm -hmm. I have other stuff that's done real well. So I have been uh, somewhat successful in real estate in a decent net worth. So let me get that out, out of the way before people just turn off the podcast going, this, <laughs> this guy knows what not to do. Hey, I already know. This guy, what this, by the way, Tim just, you know, found out about my teddy bear brigade and my backpack brigade. We did 1100 teddy bears last Friday to give to the local police department for their officers to put in the vehicles. And we did 1,600 backpacks the very next day to school children filled with school supplies, and he instantly wrote a check for $1,000. So this guy is a hitter, he's a player, and he's sure. got a big heart. And so um, anyway, let me, okay. let me just interject <laughs> that right out of the gate. And thank you publicly for your incredibly and generous donation. Rod, you're doing the hard work. Sending a check is fairly easy. No, so, thanks, brother. So my goal was to always make money in real estate. I bought my first house. Uh, uh, when I was 19 and 10 months old. And to me, that was a pretty big accomplishment because I moved from Chicago to Dallas at 18 and six months. And then, you know, a very short time after that, I, I, I bought my first house. So I've always been passionate about real estate. Well, in the middle of the recession, just like Rod, you had some challenging times in the middle of the recession. I could no longer buy, <laughs> let me, let me, to say the least. So yeah. I could... I could no longer buy single family homes, which was a blessing because it got me into multifamily. And so I got into multifamily right in the middle of the recession. And the first one I bought was a 24 unit apartment complex. But a couple things that, that I've learned. One is I bought it in a smaller rural town in Kentucky. And because I'm an anti-drug, anti-thug type of guy, we did background checks. And if they ever had a drug problem on premise or a police problem on, on premise, they're gone. Well, when you've got a small pool of people to grab from and you're starting to kick out the druggies and the thuggies, then you don't have as much, much uh, left to, to rent from. So, you know, it was a little bit of challenge on that. So you had trouble, you had trouble keeping it full. Yeah. And let me ask you a question. Did you evaluate that market before you bought? Did you, did you look at the trends? Did you, did you look to see if, you know, population was growing, income was growing, you know, yeah. uh, jobs were growing? Did you do all that or did you just I, jump I, in? I didn't. Here, here's okay. what it, I had a promotional products business in that town. Okay. And so coming from Dallas, Texas, going up there, everything looked like a bargain. Everything right. looked like oh, cash yeah. flow city. So, right. so I was all excited. And, and the other thing is the banks up there, they appreciated me. My, my financial statement or my, my uh, net worth was a lot better than 99% of people in the town. So money was easy. It looked affordable. It looked so it was easy flow. to finance. Yeah, it was easy yeah. to finance. And those small towns, you can sometimes get 90% financing, guys. Yeah. I mean, 85 a lot. But if, correct me if I'm wrong, this was like a population of 4,800, if I recall. In one so town, 4,800 in the other. Yeah, yeah. yeah so, very so, small. 
Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. So no. it, that was a mistake. So I guess what, you know, I, I see these California investors coming to Texas and everything looks affordable in Texas compared to California. So all I'm saying is be careful because I was basically the California guy going to Kentucky. I was the Texas guy that, <laughs> that thought it was a good deal. So the next thing that, that I learned the hard way was that first complex was 24 units and they were all one bedroom, one bath. And so the challenge mm. with that, as we all know now, is somebody gets marries a girl with a child or they have a child or, or whatever else, you're going to lose that renter. So um, the guy I bought that uh, complex from had other real estate holdings. So obviously he shed the thing that wasn't as good. And I simply didn't know the right questions to ask and didn't think it through. So hopefully someone in your audience can learn from, from well, that Well, sure. And, and guys, don't avoid one bedrooms, but if it's all one bedrooms, you better be in a, in a location that thrives with one bedrooms, i.e. student or retired people possibly, or, you know, you, you, need to, you need to buy based on your demographic and, you know, not just uh, on value. So very, very important that you pay attention to that. And, you know, a unit mix is always the best way to go. Ideally, majority, maybe two bedrooms and then maybe some, some threes and some ones. In most markets, that's the best way to go. So you had, you, you didn't check the demographics and I'm not trying to beat you up. I no. just want hey, to, I want to point take, this out I'll to my listeners. Hit. No. So you didn't check the demographics because guys, we're always looking for emerging markets. And, and you can go on bestplaces.net or census.gov or citydata.com and you take a look at population, you take a look at income, and you take a look at jobs. And if, they, if they're not at least flatlined, ideally going up, that's a huge red flag. And then secondly, a small town of under 5,000 very risky, very risky for a lot of reasons. Uh, typically, there's, only, there's usually only one or two large employers, which is very risky. You don't want any one-horse towns. But like you said, in those, some of these rural areas in Kentucky, Miss, I don't want to name states because I'll <laughs> piss people off and I'll get, exactly. hate mail, I'll get hate mail. But there's a lot, of, a lot of meth going on. There's a lot of drugs, so especially in the rural areas. So that's something you have to contend with. So you have to make sure you've got enough of employment base to deal with it, you know, enough of a demographic. So I know you were able to sell it and you did okay. Yeah. Did you buy other properties there as well? Talk about some of the yeah. other stuff you, you did. So back on that one real quick. So I got blinded okay. by the $30 a door getting in. You know, you couldn't build it for $30 a door. And so- 30,000 obviously. 30, yeah, sorry, 30,000. 30,000. 30,000 30, 30, a door is what I got blinded by. Um, so just, you know, per cost per door, door is nice, but just like you said, everything else is probably more important. I'd rather pay 50 a door in a growing area or 60 a door. If no question, I talked about I talk about a deal in Eden, North Carolina, and it was fifteen thousand a door, forty units. I'm like, holy cow! I mean, we were ready to get on a plane and go. And then we talk about one horse towns. Well, that horse had died. Okay, yeah. it was a brewery, and it had gone out of business. I think it's back in business now, but it was the numbers were so ugly. So, sure. so thank you for sharing that. Very, very valuable information for my listeners. Okay, so. On, on that first 24 unit, I end up doing an owner finance for 10 years just to get in it. And then I end up getting bank financed out of it real quick. So that was neat. The next one I bought was 27 units and, um, and that was an owner finance deal also. So hmm. uh, I, I think the thing I'd say to your listeners, but, but think about it, they've got less outs in that town because of the small population, sure. you, you, you got less people that, that want to be in this business and less people that can qualify. So that was an owner finance deal too. And then the one after that was actually an owner finance, uh, no, I'm sorry, it was 48 units and uh, with four different buildings and it's a very nice property. And uh, that I ended up doing bank financing with and, okay. and that was fine. And then the final one I bought was uh, kind of neat, 24 units, but it also had tr a trailer park alongside of it. So huh. I, I had a mix of some trailers I owned. And for whatever reason, I've always wanted to own a trailer park my whole life. So, so I just, I just it's think- It's a manufactured home community, please. Okay, <laughs> let's, let's, let's be proper. Let's have proper decorum. Now, we, we, love, we love mobile home parks too. No, no question. Rod, you didn't see mine. Mine was a trailer park. It was okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I appreciate you trying to put lipstick on that thing. <laughs> so, but what was cool about that is we had lot leases and then we converted the lot leases to buying mobile homes and sticking on there. So I felt like my core investment uh, of the 24 units was great. And then adding all these trailers uh, was a great way of building more revenue. Okay. And, uh, okay. and so I, I learned a lesson on that, which is great. And uh 
Well, um, I know, I know you signed a non-disclosure. You can't talk sure. about, you can't go into detail. And I get, and, and so guys, if you wonder why he's being vague, that's why yeah, he, just rec- he just recently sold the portfolio. And because you, you know, when you sign an NDA, you can't blab. But so the lessons really were demographics. Sure. The lessons were size of the population and distance from you as well. Now, I, distance is usually not a hurdle if you get a good management company. I know they were 750 miles away from you, you said, prior to recording here. And, and, sure. and you know, I don't want that to discourage anybody because if you do your homework and you find a good property management company or a broker, if it's a smaller, you, you know, smaller property and you have a broker that looks over things and then you've got somebody that gets a break on the rent that keeps an eye on the building, you know, you can absolutely do it at a distance, but you and, can't beat the demographics. You can't, you can't, you can't go against the surf, you know? Uh, and Rod, I, I'm totally not a victim mentality type of guy yeah. or a blame guy. I, I, I shoulder all the blame and I have other successful businesses where I've had people for 17, 18 years. So I, I know how to run businesses. I know how to treat people. It's just mm-hmm. the challenge was I just couldn't find a rock star. And trust me, I kept looking for a rock oh, star. Oh, in, in the local the economy. I had the yeah. same thing. I had the same thing happen in Memphis. I had a, a property manager embezzle 100 grand from me. And now I'm going to get nice. hate mail from all the Tennesseans again. So I bring <laughs> up Memphis once in a while. <laughs> I, had a, I had a huge seminar there. But anyway, there's no question that you're a great businessman. And it's so easy to get blinded. And that's why, that, that's why this lesson is so important. It's so easy to get blinded by these low cost per door or maybe seller financing that just looks fantastic and you can get into a deal and maybe you sign on for the seller financing, but you only do a five-year balloon, which is yep. dangerous, you know, with a contraction coming. So guys, eyes wide open. That's the key here. Have eyes wide open. Don't rush do your homework, but you came out okay. It just wasn't the home run you thought it was. I mean, that's, no. I, I know, right? And, and, and that's fine. And, yeah. you know, there's, uh, there's plenty of stuff that you do that work and doesn't work. Um, right. my, my high-end uh, residential is doing great. Uh, I will definitely buy multifamily again. Right. Um, I just, right. I just, you know, I went up to the plate and struck out a few times. Now I know what pitch to look for. Hey, and, and that's yeah, how it and, goes. And, and it's, you're an entrepreneur. I mean, you're a shiny right. penny guy like I am. And you know, I've started 22 businesses and some have been worth tens of millions and most have been spectacular seminars. Okay. Yeah. And I, I call them seminars because I always learn, but uh, <laughs> uh, failures, spectacular failures. All right. Well, let's talk about your book, brother, because it is awesome. And you've got some great chapters in here that I want you to expand on because you can really add a lot of value to my listeners with some of this stuff. So I'm, I've got your book open. And I've Rod, highlighted- you're pretty good at this. You segue right to the number one thing on the cover of the book, which is mistaken failures are mandatory. And, <laughs> hey, and, uh, I, heard, I heard Sarah Blakely, who's the billionaire of Spanx. I met her at yeah. a workshop that I was at. And she said her dad told her what did you fail at today every day? So I've been texting my son, driving him crazy. What did you <laughs> fail at today? He, he doesn't respond. That. But, but I, I love that too. That's so awesome. So let's talk about that first. What, what I found is, and I wrote in the book, is my wealthy, successful friends talk about failure openly and honestly, and they talk about what they learn. My friends that haven't been successful or, uh, in business, they, they want to hide it. They want to stick mm-hmm. it in a corner. They want to act like it's not there. And so in my book, I, you know, I talk about some things that I failed at and, you know, I've, I've had people come back on, thank you for talking about that because I keep focusing on my failed marriage. Or I keep focusing on a bad deal I did and I can't get it out of my head. It's just rolling around in there. So you and I both are on the same page where you're going to make mistakes. You can't avoid them. You gotta, you gotta just do it. Right. No, no question. Let me add to that because what you said, you, you talk to people and they say, I can't, you know, I focus on my bad marriage. I focus on this guys where focus goes, energy flows. So focus on what you want. Okay. This is why I know you've got goal setting in your book. I'm a huge proponent for goal setting and getting pictures of your goals and writing down why your goals are a must so that when you get your butt kicked, because you will, I promise you, you're going to get your nose bloodied, that you focus on why you're doing what you're doing. I lost 50 million bucks. So Tim, I got your ass beat. I'm sorry, but I do. <laughs> you, you I, did. I, I, you're I, one I, up and, in and, me there. <laughs> and, 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 I, and I'm sorry that I am, but I will tell you, I love that line. Those of you that have kids, 
tell your kids, what did you fail at today? So they go out and try new things. And, and I protected mine and I regret it, honestly. My kids are successful and I love them and all that. But, but I do regret not, not I, I just love that when I heard Sarah talk about her dad. And look, at she went from $5,000. She's a billionaire, owns a company 100% herself. That's so awesome. Kudos to her. So chapter, chapter 41, because you're just segueing as good as a, a late night DJ over there, uh, <laughs> is, uh, is, is find the why. Yeah. And so to me, to me, the why is so important. Uh, I've got a kid working for me. He's trying to buy his first house. And he, he had some goal that he wanted to sell 50 websites because we've got the ability to do that. And we've got some secret sauce on it. And mm -hmm. I said, okay, let's break it down. I said, you're making 500 a website. I said, you want to buy a house, you can get a 3% down on a $200,000 house. You backed you, into it. You, you, exactly. So, mm -hmm. so six grand, now all you have to do is sell 12 websites. I said, now that's your why. And, and I go, if I was you, I'd mark off 12 and start Xing them off so you know where you go. Now I'm going to segue like a late night DJ <laughs> into the fact that your goals have to be measurable and concise, okay? They have to be measurable and that's what you just did for that young man. Beautiful. That brings reality to it and it's a great way to approach your goals, guys. Those of you listening, back into what you have to do every month, every week, every day, every hour to get you to that goal, okay? And that's, that's awesome. So another chapter that you've got that I wanted to ask you about is encourage the next generation. Now, I mean, yep. I, I just love that and so important. Well, I, I can tell that you weren't born with wealth and you, it didn't no. come easy for you and neither did I, but listeners take that as a blessing because I'm not hoping to inherit anything when I was younger. I knew right from the get-go if it's gonna be, it had to be me, that famous saying. And so that got me on goals and and, I've had a very fortunate life, but I'm always trying to encourage any young person. Someone hits me up on an email or, or anything, I'm going to take the time to call them or communicate with them because I've been so extremely fortunate to have great mentors. Uh, you know, I got a little saying that mentors come before money just like it does in the dictionary. So if there's somebody you want to learn from, wash their car, go buy them a cup of coffee. Add do value to takes. them in some way. Absolutely. Exactly. Yep. So many people want the help but they're not willing to do something. I, I, I'm blown away because about half the time, I'm very positively surprised. People are like, what can I do for you? Can I buy you lunch? Can I buy you a cup of coffee? Can I donate to your charity? Mm -hmm. You know, what can I do for you? And, and typically charitable guys like you and I, man, if you donate to my charity, I'll give you whatever you want. Oh, you know? yeah. I mean, yeah, I'm all about absolutely. the 100% of the money of this goes to uh, the food bank in Keller, Texas. No kidding. Oh, yeah. I'm 100 not making a Did you guys hear that? This book, 50 Things They Didn't Teach You in School, go buy it. All the money goes to the food bank. I mean, I didn't know that, brother. Yeah, I, I'm, it, so, it I'm so impressed. And, and by the way, that's chapter two, the joy of generosity. I was going to save that for the end, but yeah. I, I've got to talk about it now because, guys, two things. One, like Tim just said, go into every relationship, just not, a, not even just a mentor relationship. Go in to give, not to get. And you will get. You'll get tenfold. But you have to have the mindset to go in to give. And then secondly... I know you've heard the adage, what you give comes back tenfold. I'm here to tell you it is absolutely the truth in every area of your life, be it love, be it happiness, be it financial, be it time. So love it, brother. Love it. Rod, so, I, I, it's funny because Zig Ziglar was one of the first books I read as a young man. And if you help enough people get what they want, you're going to mm -hmm. get what you want. And I'm sitting there driving a Saab 900, listening to a cassette tape of Zig. And uh, well, I'm being an outside sales guy up in the Chicago area, and I'm like, I don't have anything. And you're telling me I got to go give you something, Rod? I'm like, I don't even have anything. I'm renting an apartment, driving a, an old used car, and you're telling me I got to help you out first. But I swear to God, I live my life that way. If you bring enough value, people, people. The secret to success is adding value. The more value you add, the more successful you'll become. The more you give, the more you get. The most successful people on the planet give more than anyone else. There's I a totally reason agree. for that, guys. Get the memo here. There's a reason for this. And it's so funny you had a Saab 900, me too. Oh, I, actually had, I actually had to sell it one week to make payroll. This is back uh -oh. when I was in my 20s and dumber than I am now. But uh, <laughs> anyway, awesome. So let's talk about leverage, okay? This is real estate related and I, you guys pretty much, I would mess, guess most of the people on my show know what it means, but I, I wanna hear your definition. Sure, I love leverage. So, you know, if you're gonna save money, it's just gonna take forever and you, you can't get there. 
so I look at leverage as trying to get good debt. So when I first learned about leverage, there's a buddy of mine named Pat Nolan down in Corpus Christi, Texas. He had an alarm company and I'm in the alarm industry. He borrowed against the assets of his alarm company to build his uh, first storage facility. He now owns 13 of them and wow. it's worth a lot, a lot of money. But I was Mr. 15 year note, driving used Honda Accords. Pay Mr. it off, free and clear, off, safety, out. safety conscious. Zero, yeah. zero credit card debt. So right. it's, it's hard to shift a guy like that to understand leverage. I always joke, I'm like, how do you rob eight banks and stop? Because if you're a bank robber, you can't stop robbing banks. And if you're a conservative guy like I was, it's hard to buy into leverage. So I learned leverage through my friend. I saw what he did with borrowing against a business to get into storage. And then he re-leveraged again because that what he borrowed against his business was 20% down on the storage. Well, then the next storage unit got full and then he borrowed against the storage and the security and got the next one. For me as a young guy coming from nothing, trying to play it safe, that seemed like risky business. But when he really, it really spelled it out to me, uh, you know, I really understood it. If you think about it, if, if, if something goes up 10% and you debt reduction at 5% in a year, wouldn't you rather have a hundred million of it versus a million or 10? Hello, hello. <laughs> Just do the math, guys. You, tr you, pay, you pay cash for something versus leveraging something. The returns are exponentially different. Awesome, awesome, awesome. So chapter 13, one in 98, I want you to expand on that. I loved, I loved when you told me that. Sure. Earlier. Yeah. So 90, it's almost like the temperature of the human body is 98.6% of Americans will never have the net worth of a million dollars. And that's excluding the equity in their home. That's a little caveat mm. uh, because think about it, a lot of people in California, they're millionaires because of equity in their home. So right. let's take a high 90 number. So my whole point of that is if, if there's 100 people in the room and two are going to be millionaires and 98 aren't, and now we've got 98 voices in our ear versus listening to the two millionaires, and that's kind of how life is. You know, i got another chapter that says, watch out for the vice and advice. Be careful who you're taking information from. I mean, Stand talk, guard at the door to your mind, yeah. okay? <laughs> it, Very it, important. Okay. It's, it's funny. I did a talk uh, earlier this week and I, I basically said, put a bouncer in front of your, your mind. If, if you got a voicemail that you know is going to be negative, just erase it. You got Thank an email, you. just erase it. You can't, you can't let that stuff rattle around. Turn off head. the news. I don't watch the news anymore. Sometimes I'll go on just for a minute for amusement, uh, depending on which, if I, if I want to see blue or red, but yeah. other than that, you know, I, I, I don't even, you know, that's, that's awesome. But, but back to the one in 98, right? I mean, it, it, it's going to be tough to be a millionaire. It should be tough to be a millionaire. And once you are a millionaire, you'll appreciate that you are. But the other thing is if you get it too quick, you're probably going to lose it like a lottery ticket winner or a, mm -hmm. a you know a, a, a kid star or something because you did build the building blocks of lessons that you learned so that you could keep it forever i mean i know you'll never lose your wealth ever again i i won't either right. only because I'm, I'm so battle scarred from lessons from really sure. really expensive lessons that that you you know what you're doing now. So that's why mentors, I'm circling back on a lot of things, but that's why mentors are important too, because those mentors of successful people have failed more than you and I. That's why we know their names. So right. let's go, let's go find out what they, they're doing. Right. Well, no you know, question. Like, like nope. them or don't like them. I'm reading Jerry Jones's autobiography because he's nice. got elected in the hall of fame. Oh my God. He almost drove it in the ditch a hundred times before that. I read Phil Knight's autobiography. Oh, Nike. Oh yeah, my love God. It. Yeah, I mean, yeah. just so don't think, oh, Phil Knight, he's a billionaire and it was easy. It, it wasn't easy for anyone. Sarah, Sarah Blakely used to go into Nordstrom's and sell the stuff there and, and she'd put her stuff in the front of the rack. And, <laughs> and I mean, I mean, and now she's a billionaire. I've, I've heard John Paul DeJoria, the guy that yeah. did uh, Paul Mitchell hair products, door to door Killing. hair salons. Then he did Patron, two billion dollar companies, took Patron liquor store to liquor store to bar to bar. And, and. There is no get rich quick. There's a become very wealthy if you put in the, the time and you focus, you surround yourself with the right people. You find mentors, like you just said, Tim. Awesome stuff. Awesome stuff. All right. Chapter 14, you bet. This is real simple. Bet on yourself. You know, I love it. when you bet on yourself, at least if you screw up, you know who to blame. But it seems like whenever I blindly give, and I won't anymore, but in the past, when I blindly gave money to... Uh, open up a restaurant, you know, or, or do all this other crazy stuff. My whole thing is I, I need to be leveraged and I need to know what I'm doing and I need it to be somewhat passive like real estate. I don't want to loan 
money for a restaurant to some guy that I don't know particularly well in an industry, talk about doing your homework, like de low demographic areas, it, that restaurant business is horrible. What, uh, nine the, out of 10 fail? Statistics, statistics are terrible. I have a friend that just invested in one in Tampa and I cringed when he told me. And the thing of it is, the bottom line is, it's okay if you're gonna do it and you either align yourself with an expert or you become the expert. Just don't dabble. Okay. And, and I, I'm totally against giving my money to somebody else. I, I, I just am, unless, unless you really are aligned with an expert and, and it's just, it's, it's, it's dangerous. And, and so many people like will invest in the stock market and they'll rely on the, on the advice of a stockbroker that, you know, frankly got trained more in sales than in studying the stock market. So, you know, yeah. just, uh, there's, there's great, great advice there too. All right. I love chapter 23. School is always in section, session. Love yeah. it. Please, please expand on it. <laughs> okay. So you're doing well. I'm doing well. A bunch of the listeners are doing well. So what? <laughs> you know right. what? I mean, I'm reading Jerry Jones's autobiography. I'm reading Phil Knight's autobiography. I'm, I'm listening to podcasts. I'm watching webinars. I love learning. I mean, I, I love learning something new. I love being in a room where people are, are far more wealthy than me. Just right. get a piece of duct tape and listen. You know what I mean? Thank it's, you. It, it's fun being in a room where people know so much more than you do about something. I just feel like I'm getting a free MBA in life. Love and, it. Uh, and so that's, that's school's always no, a session. No, I love it. Don't think you're I've, done. I've, I've got this drawer because I, I didn't go to college. I actually, you know, I admit that publicly. I don't think I've done that before. I didn't go to college, but I've got a drawer that has the lanyards from all the events that I've gone to. And I've got to, you know, I'm going to do an episode on that. I'm going to bring it in here That's and cool. just hang, hang them off my arm here. I mean, there's hundreds. Okay. And I mean, I'm, I'm a member of three very expensive masterminds, high level. I mean, obviously people like the people I've mentioned here. And so guys, learning is earning. And there's no destination. It's a continual process. I remember my son coming up to me when he was nine years old. And I had, you know, lived in this $8 million testament to my ego on the beach. And I had hundreds of houses and multifamily units and the Maserati and all this stuff. And I told him I was going to a real estate seminar. And he's like, why are you going to a real estate seminar? And then, and then I was able to give him the lesson that I'm talking about publicly here. And that is that, that you have in your book. You never stop learning. So well, that's, that's funny. I was on a plane reading a book about marketing. I really love marketing. And a, right. a colleague of mine came up and goes, why are you reading about marketing? You're the best marketing guy I know. And uh, what I always think about is why is the jogger always skinny? He's skinny <laughs> because he's jogging. You know what I mean? And, and I'm reading marketing because I want to be a better marketer. I'll bet, and, I've got, I'll bet I've got 200 books on real estate investing in my library that I've purchased in the last three years. Yeah. Or four or five years. Uh, seriously. And, and, and uh, there you go. Awesome. Chapter 32, ask questions. And that's so funny because I just, at, I just texted my son this morning that said, the best human trait you can have is curiosity. That was, I yep. sent him these inspirational texts. Awesome. Um, ask questions. You know, I, I, I was lucky. I was a good bartender and I got hired to be a sales guy when I was about 20 years old. And I thought being in sales was just talking, talking, talking. Well, it turned out the guy that hired me ended up being president of Honeywell eventually. In, mm. in a sh street smart guy, savvy, you know, uh, real good guy. But what he taught me is, is, you know, you got two ears and one mouth, use it in the right uh, ratio. And, and the reality is the more you ask, the, the more you're going to learn. If you, if you and I are in a meeting and I do 100% of talking, I still know what I know. And now you know everything that you know and I know. So who, who want? So you want to know. I want to know what I want to know what you know. Love it. I didn't realize that's, I didn't have a chance to read that chapter. I didn't realize that's the direction you were going. I like that even better. Guys, in this business, you're going to have relationships with brokers, lenders, investors, partners, your team. And like Dale Carnegie in his book, How to Win Friends and Influence People, you want to steer a conversation with questions. You want them to talk. You're learning, you're growing. And in sales, the best salespeople on the planet are the ones that, that ask the most questions. They, they allow the prospect to talk and basically sell themselves and, and talk about their objections. And so, yeah, become an expert at asking questions. Love it. Love Rod, it. I'm going to toss one more that I know you agree with, but thank you notes changed my life. I was oh, in yeah. a Tom, Tom Hopkins seminar in Kansas City, Missouri. 
I had uh, him on the I had him on the show, and, oh, and I got a, I got a flood of thank you notes after I had him on the show. It was awesome. Yeah. So so I'm sitting there. I'm feeling bad. I took a customer because basically I should have been seeing five people that day instead of sinking off to probably a ninety nine dollars seminar back you know, 25 years ago. But I look at everything as I just want one nugget. I look at myself as a composite rock. I want to grab a piece of that person's good trait, that person's good oh, trait. Oh, I love it. So, so I walked in that seminar going, I just want one thing. And the one thing I got from uh, Tom Hopkins was thank you notes. So then I, it, yeah, I was a lousy sales guy. So you basically kicked me out of your office. I'm like, hey, thanks for the time. I look forward to spending a little bit more time with you the next time. So you kick me out and I give you a thank you note. Well, what ended up happening is people are like, okay, this guy sucks as a sales guy, but he's somewhat likable and he does follow up. So maybe he's a man of integrity. And so I've written thank you notes for forever, which leads to another chapter called Happy Moms. Hold I on, before you, before you go oh, on, before you go on, I want, I want to hear Happy Moms, but it's happy I, got two, I got two, th I had Tom on the show twice okay. and I got two handwritten thank you notes from Tom. And it's awesome. just talk about a class act. When you get one, it's just so powerful. I actually have a board at home from the thank you notes I've gotten from my listeners and I've got them, I've got them stick pinned on there. I, I, I need to take a picture of it. It's so powerful guys. So, so don't, don't, let's not just gloss over there. Don't was, count on what, yeah. don't count on being thanked, but that was one year's worth of uh, thank you notes. So every year I bag them. Oh, it's and tag it. you got them. it in here. Oh, that's yeah. awesome. Every year that's I bag awesome. I bag them and tag them, and then start the new year. I, with, if, if I didn't screw up the setup that I'm on, I'm staring at my basket of thank you notes, and I bet there's at least 125 received thank you notes this year Love already. It. So it's pretty neat. But but happy bombs is like a, a, a thank you note point five. You know what what that is is let's say that I know you're into you know, let, let's say we talked about both having Saab 900s and I right. go find a die cast Saab 900 and then I mail it to you going, Hey Rod, thanks. Thanks for your time. And you know what? Once I saw the video on tiny hands, I felt guilty that I only gave you a thousand. Here's another thousand and it's little die cast Saab 900. Oh, oh that would be so, so much funny more. That you say that I've got a, a coaching client that literally I, my first car was a 70 road runner and oh, he found, he found a Mattel, you know, the little, little die cast 70 road runner. I didn't even know they existed and sent it to me. I'm like, I, I put it on my Facebook page. Talk about thoughtful. I, you know, I put it alongside a picture of me next to this car. Of course I look like a hot mess, but I, <laughs> I got, I got to pick. Yeah, it was so thoughtful. And so, so now I, oh man, that takes, that takes gratitude and acknowledgement to a whole nother level when you it, do something like that, it's guys. thank you notes on steroids. And yeah. What, and so I, it's called Happy Bombs. It's a chapter. And what happy, I call Oh, it, bombs. I kept yeah. thinking you were saying moms like mothers. Got it. Happy bombs. Yeah. And okay. why, I call, why I call it a happy bomb is because I do so much, and I'm not trying to brag, but I, but I follow up like crazy. I throw so much out there that I'm not doing one thing, waiting for it to come back like we're playing tennis. Right. I throw so much stuff out there. I'm busy on to the next thing. So then when someone texts or emails me or calls me and goes, thank you for whatever it is, uh, like, for example, your assistant, Ron, uh, emailed me yesterday. Hey, thanks for the check. Next time, maybe sign it. <laughs> I forgot to sign <laughs> yeah, the check. Right. <laughs> but, uh, but that was a happy bomb that, good, you got it. And good, you got it before we went on the show. So that's what I call happy bombs. And then one little iteration on that. I'm a big Thanksgiving guy instead of Christmas. When you mail out Christmas gifts to your business friends, they're in a stack of other Christmas gifts. So mm -hmm. I, jump, I jump the gun on it, and I, I give out thank, uh, Thanksgiving gifts. I normally give out food because people, when you give food, like, oh, who sent us what? So there's good buzz. But I want to get ahead of that whole season. And deep in my heart, I'm such a thankful guy that that holiday really resonates with me. So I do Thanksgiving instead of Christmas to get ahead of everything and get it on out there. Love it. Love it, buddy. I absolutely love it. Um, so we're talking about multifamily. And next thing you know, we're a self-help podcast. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. You know, hey, I, if, I know that everybody listening is getting incredible value. So... No, no worries. Okay. Number 37, no instant pill for success. I want you to expand on that. That's huge. Guys, pay attention to this one. It's not going to happen fast. It's not going to happen nope. easy and it shouldn't. And if it does happen fast and easy, you need to be quadruple worried yes. because you didn't learn enough lessons to keep it. And so, you know, I get these people like, man, I want to be just like you. I'm like, all right, well, let me, let me tell you how it works. You know, you work for 31 years. Uh, uh, you start with a paper out when you're 12. I'm 51, so I'm counting those, those 31 years. You do more for others. You give away more money than all your friends. You know, on and on and on. So don't You're be always learning. You keep yeah. growing. You keep learning. You get up early. You do what you have to do to make it happen. You grind. Don't, don't be discouraged. 
Right. No, it's going to take a while. But the other thing that I know you and I 100% agree on is multiple uh, lines of revenue, multiple streams of revenue. It's so important. You know what I love when a bank looks at a W-2 wage earner, let's pick on pilots so you get hate mail from pilots. And so this pilot's making 200000 a year from a, a major airline. Well, that's one oxygen line to him. If that gets pinched, cut, whatever, the guy's 100% done with, with his source of money. I probably have... 250 different streams of revenue no kidding. Uh, and, 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 and and i love it because it's it's just it i feel like if it's if it's a table with one leg underneath it you knock that leg out you're down but if you have 250 take a big whack and 80 percent of it's still standing so anyone that is is has one revenue stream try to figure out how you can create other revenue streams no, that's why these that's why you guys are listening to this show because this is an incredible one and it, you don't have to stop there multifamily is awesome and there's there's all sorts of things you can do and i will say but I, with a caveat make sure you enjoy it make sure it's something yeah. you enjoy that's critical would you agree totally i yeah. i people are just like they're blown away by how happy I am. I'm happy because I'm doing exactly what I want to do every day. But it wasn't always that way. I mean, I had bosses I didn't particularly agree with, work ethic, moral, whatever. I had to endure all that to finally create uh, an opportunity. But my favorite opportunity that I know you'll agree with is real estate. Because right. you're not having to go set up a chair and sit in front of one of your apartment complexes today from nine to five. You're right. doing a podcast. You're doing what you love. So right. look for revenue streams. But the best revenue streams are leverage revenue streams and passive income revenue streams. Those are the best because if you have active revenue streams that require a lot of you, you're not going to be able to have time to do other. That's right. No, that's right. Leveraged and passive uh, is the way to go. And that's, that's the framework for what we're doing here with multifamily. And really any, any uh, real estate falls into that category. So fantastic. You've got another chapter called You Inc. Expand on that one, please. Um, okay. So when I was a young sales guy, people were like, like, let's say that you work for Coke. Why would you go talk to Pepsi and Dr. Pepper? They're like, why are you talking to, to the other people? And I'm like, I know everything we're doing and I want to find out what they're doing. And I view, view it as anytime I invest in my knowledge, and I know it's kind of re repetitive on some other stuff, but you got to invest in yourself. You got to find out what the competition doing. If you lost your job with Coke, you probably are a good guy to hire at Pepsi. But if they hate you over there, then you're probably – you're probably not going to get a job. So be friendly with your competitors. Find out what's going on. Invest in yourself. I, I, I bet I haven't listened to three full songs in, in the car in 30 years because I'm always on the phone. i am always got something positive uh, in the background, and I'm always investing in myself. I mean, so I, I, the people that check out for hours on end watching TV or, or this or that, it's a waste of time. You got to invest yeah. in yourself. And especially if you're not where you need to be. Thank if you. you're not where you need to be, then, I mean, maybe if you've done okay, give yourself a little bit of a treat of something that's mindless. But if you're not where you're at, throw away the TV and start listening to podcasts, start reading books, start investing on you. You Inc. You Inc. Love it, brother. Well, listen, this has been an awesome episode, and I know you've added an incredible amount of value. And uh, guys, get his book because everything goes to charity. It's 50 Things They Didn't Teach You in School. We'll have a link in the show notes, Tim Shiner. It's thank on you, Amazon. Brother. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, it's on Amazon. Yeah, th thank you. Thank you, brother. You've, you've really added value. It's been a real treat. And thank you again for your gift to my foundation. Guys, I'm, I'm, I'm doubling don't make it, it happen. I'm sending you another thousand bucks. So. Oh, and this, this time I'll sign the check. Wow. So, well, wow. here's the deal. Once I saw your video yesterday that Ron, your assistant, sent, seeing all the kids getting backpacks, uh, you know, you first told me about the teddy bear, but then seeing the backpacks, I mean, being, a, being a, a child that doesn't have much and going to school without the proper stuff, you start right out of the gate as like that kid. And so, wow. yeah. Wow. Thank you, brother. Thank you so much. And you're so right. Can you imagine being a kid going to school and you look to the guy, the, the kid next to you, he's got everything he needs and you don't have Ugh. even, you know, the basics and uh, any, you rock, man. Thank All you. Right. Thanks and for guys, thanks for listening. Tim, how do they reach you if they want to reach out to you? Uh, Tim do you have a Shiner, website? Yeah, timshiner.com. Just Tim, S-H-I-N-E-R.com. The other thing on that website is a free poster, 25 Habits of a Future Millionaire. It's basically the habits that I believe are necessary for you to become a millionaire. A Perfect. lot of people have it on their wall. It's free. Awesome. There you go. Awesome. Thanks, buddy. Thanks. Well, thanks again for being on the show. Added tons of value. 
And uh, thanks again for your, gen- your next generous gift. You rock. Yeah. Thanks, bud. Bye. Take care. Thank you for listening to the Lifetime Cash Flow Through Real Estate Investing Podcast. If you've enjoyed the show, please subscribe and then take a moment to visit iTunes and leave a five-star rating and review. For more resources to connect with us further, please visit our website at lifetimecashflowpodcast.com. Tune in next week for our next show.